Welcome back to some more script editing for Generation 5. When I made the first parts of this, I only went over some of the basic, commonly used script commands, with the understanding that there's way too many aspects of scripting to cover in a single video. The most common question I was asked is how to add new trainer battles, which I'll definitely be talking about in this video. But the reason this took so long to make is that I didn't know what kind of script I wanted to write, but I realized that I could just show off some of the scripts I've already made in the past, which showcases the things I want to talk about. Once again, writing scripts usually isn't that complicated, it's just time consuming. And you may have to study other scripts to understand the behavior you're looking for. So let's get started with something basic, and we'll work our way up from there. Before we start looking at the script files themselves, I want to talk about all the different ways scripts can get run. The most basic way is with an NPC. Whenever you talk to an NPC, it'll run the script sequence listed here, which is the method I showed off in the last part. In addition to that, there's also furniture objects, which are like invisible NPCs that run a script when you click on them. An example of this is the hidden items that you can find with the DAO's machine. And then there's triggers, which will run a script whenever the player walks over a defined set of tiles. This is useful for two reasons. First off, you can make it cover a lot of space, such as the entire width of a pathway. And second, it can force the player into a script without them having to manually interact with anything, guaranteeing they don't miss it. Here you can see where our trigger might be useful. This police officer is blocking the path to Route 2, so we can't access it. If I talk to him, he says that Route 2 is off limits, but he's not actually blocking the area that would prevent me from going down there. Instead, there's a trigger placed in front of him, where when I walk over it, it'll stop me, it'll tell me Route 2 is off limits, and then it'll force me back up. So no matter where I try to walk down from, he'll always stop me. And the script for this is very simple. There's a single message and two movement instructions. You'll see that the NPC ID for the second movement is 255, which represents the player. So the player is forced to walk up out of the trigger. But here I've loaded up a save after beating the game, and you'll notice that the police officer is gone, and I'm allowed to walk through here freely. Since in a lot of cases you only want triggers to run under certain conditions, let's take a look at how that works. For NPCs, you can set this flag value, where if the flag is set, it'll prevent the NPC from spawning. And then for triggers, we can take a look at the variable and value entries. The way these work is the trigger will only run if the variable provided is equal to the value provided. If the values aren't equal, then you can walk over the trigger and the script won't run. In my example, the variable is set to 0 by default, which means the script will run. So if I want the script to stop running, I have to change the variable to a value other than 0. For example, I added these two instructions to a script that runs when you talk to your mom after beating the Elite Four for the first time. Setting the flag stops the NPC from spawning, and setting the variable stops the trigger from running. The last way to run scripts is something that's not as well documented, but I'll try to put up some visuals to explain it. Under the Extras tab, you'll see the data for what's known as level scripts. These basically tell the game to run a script whenever the area is loaded in. Similar to triggers, this means the scripts will be run automatically without the player's input. Also similar to triggers, you can set them to only work if a variable is equal to a certain value. Here you can see me walk through this door, and without me pressing any buttons, the game will still force me into a cutscene. Now that we started the cutscene, let's see what these scripts look like in practice. First I have the player take a few steps down, and a text box appears from a character off screen. I also create three new NPCs with the command here so we can use them in the cutscene. A lot of the cutscenes you see in game mostly focus on movements and messages which you can see if I scroll down here. If we scroll down a bit more, you'll see some commands that are used to move the camera around. The parameters for this command are a bit unusual, but the method I use to read them is to pull up a calculator, input the desired values, and left shift them by 16 for the X and Z positions. Next we have more movements and text boxes, and a sequence where the player plays an animation of putting something in their bag. For this hack, this cutscene takes place at the start of the game, and I use it to give the player Eevee as their starter Pokemon. And when I do this, I also have to set flag 2401, which allows the player to view their Pokemon in the menu. And then with that Pokemon, I can start a trainer battle with Team Plasma. In this case, I set the third parameter to 1, which means that if the player loses the fight, the script will still continue. After the trainer battle, the camera gets reset, so I have to move it to the right place again. And then we use Trainer Battle Ends to go back to the overworld. If you did want the player to black out and go back to the Pokemon Center when they lose, then you would instead run Trainer Battle Lose if the result of the battle is zero. 
Instead, I use the variable to change up the dialogue based on whether the player won or lost. And once that's done, Team Plasma runs off and disappears from the scene. Along with Hugh after some more dialogue. So you can see how the cutscene itself isn't all that complicated. It's just long and has a lot of different parts. And here's the entire cutscene in real time. Now in case you did want to have the normal blackout behavior, you would use this trainer battle lose command. This is what will take the player back to the Pokemon Center and end the script so that nothing else gets run. You'll also see that I set the second parameter in the trainer battle command. By doing this, the game will start a double battle with two different trainers. And I should also mention that static encounters have their own set of commands, as well as an extra command that checks how the battle was won. For example, whether the player caught the Pokemon or KO'd it. On the topic of adding trainer battles, the trainer editor does allow us to add new trainers to the game. And by selecting a trainer beforehand, it'll copy over all the values for convenience. But there is a catch to this when it comes to the trainers you see on routes. Standard route trainers use what's known as global scripts, and they have some weird quirks to them. Most notably, if you add trainers with this button, they won't work properly if you try to assign them as a route trainer. Also due to how the global script is set up, the route trainers won't work if you set them to a double battle, but triple and rotation battles are okay. There are ways to get around these, but they'll require some more work and research into how the game normally handles them. The last thing I want to talk about is giving the player dialogue options. For example, this script will allow me to choose from a greater selection of starter Pokemon. The simplest form of dialogue is a yes-no box. For whatever variable you put in, It'll get set to 0 if the player selected yes, and 1 if the player selected no. Then you can use an if statement to run different parts of the scripts depending on what the player chose. But if you want to give the player more choices, then you'll have to use these commands here. For each choice you want the player to have, you'll use this add dialog option command. The first parameter is the line of text that gets shown, and the third parameter is the value that gets assigned to the return variable. In this case, 0x 8020. Then, once again, you can run different code by checking the value of the return variable. You can also choose whether the player is allowed to cancel their selection. And if this happens, the return variable will be set to some large value, which you can check by testing if the variable is larger than whatever the largest value you set is. If you want, you can draw out the different options as a diagram, and translate each path to a block of code like this. Beyond that, the stuff you put in those blocks of code is just more of the same. So that's all I have for you today. If you still need help with anything, feel free to join my Discord, which is linked in the description. And be sure to subscribe if you want to see more content in the future. With all that said, good luck, and I'll see you next time.